Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we'll be talking about the linear control of uh, manipulators and uh, in the last class we looked at uh, sensors and before that we talked about uh, uh, kinematics and then dynamics. So today we'll continue with uh, linear control that is using sensors, actuators, how do we actually control a system. So uh, if you look at this slide, basically the, uh, the total control system uh, or the total system consists of four parts which is the controller. Then, uh, which is the controller here, then we have the motor which is an actuator and uh, then we have a sensor which is uh, here to give the position feedback. So it consists of number one is the controller, the second part is the actuator uh, which, is, which is a motor in this case, then there is a sensor which is for feedback which is an optical encoder uh, in this particular case and then there is the process model or the actual link. So the process model here in our case is a link and this is in closed loop uh, control system. Okay. So essentially what we are uh, saying here is that uh, every joint of the robot link is independently controlled. That means every joint would be having uh, one pair of uh, uh, an actuator, there would be the link and there will be a sensor which is in closed loop feedback uh, control. Now uh, we also explained in the last class that essentially this uh, closed loop uh, control system is required because the con controller here is electrical. So it understands only electric, uh, electrical, uh, electrical signals and because of which the input that uh, the output from here is going to be electrical to the motor and whatever is coming into the controller also has to be electrical. And we also explained that an actuator essentially means uh, an actuator essentially converts energy from one form to another. So in this case it is, uh, it is converting the electrical voltage uh, uh, to a mechanical motion. So uh, the motor is rotating and then the link is moving in this direction or if it is a robot link it can move also like that. Okay. Now when it is moving this is mechanical energy, so the mechanical energy has to be converted back into electrical energy and that is the function of the sensor. So sensors and actuators are essentially uh, uh, inverse of one another. Now uh, uh, let us look at uh, very briefly at what we had studied. We had said that the uh, position sensor is essentially an encoder and we also explained the working of an encoder. So the working of an encoder is essentially working on emitter receiver pair and we have an emitter and we have a receiver there and if light is passing through you, you get a signal of 1, if light is not passing through you get a signal of 0. So essentially it is 1, 0, 1, 0 in that sequence. And from this we can find the position because we know what is the distance in terms of theta between any of these two, uh, two bits. So I know what is theta, so essentially we can find the velocity d theta by dt and the second derivative of that we can find as the acceleration of theta double dot, right. So this theta dot and we can also find theta double dot. So using the encoder we can essentially find the position, velocity and acceleration. Uh, so this is the sensor uh, that we are going to use which is most commonly used and uh, the actuator here uh, is a DC motor. So we are familiar with how DC motor works, essentially if we give a voltage what would happen is it will generate a magnet, uh, so the voltage going through these coils would generate a magnetic field and this magnetic field is going to interact with the magnetic field of the permanent magnet and there will be a resultant uh, motion there will be a resultant torque and uh, that resultant torque is going to rotate the motor. Okay. So in our actuator sensor that we are talking about here, essentially we can say this is a DC motor okay, and uh, my sensor here is an encoder. Okay. And the robot link is a robot link, it can be rotating type, or it can be prismatic type. Okay. And uh, controllers, we will come to controllers or microcontrollers later. So microcontrollers we will see uh, later in, uh, in subsequent lectures. So here uh, let us talk about uh, the basic structure or the basic layout of the control system. So we have, uh, if I draw it here, we have a robot link and it has a number of joints and there is an end effector here. So this is my base uh, and uh, this is my end effector at the end. Okay. Now every joint of this has uh, uh, independent joint unit which is consists of a motor. So there is a motor here, uh, there is a gear and there is an encoder uh, at the back 
and this is connected to the controller uh, which can be a PC or it can be a microcontroller. Now each oh, independent joint control basically means that each of these joints will be having one unit of this motor gear encoder and here also there is one motor gear encoder. So there is a motor, there is a gear, there is an encoder there. Right. Now, uh, fundamentally what we understood from our dynamics when we studied uh, a couple of classes back. Now, our dynamic equations basically showed us that the dynamic equation can be written of the form of the torque, joint torque which is coming here is equal to uh, three components which is the inertia term which is inertia into, uh, so it is inertia into uh, the acceleration plus it is C theta and theta dot which is the Coriolis centrifugal plus gravity term. Okay, plus external forces which is external here. right? So essentially we say that the total torque acting at a joint is made up of the inertia torque. So this is my inertia torque, then there is Coriolis plus centrifugal torque, centrifugal forces plus there is gravity and uh, here there is gravity. Now what does this equation tell us? This equation basically tells us that the total torque would depend on theta, it will depend on theta dot and theta dot double dot at the joints. And when we looked at uh, our study of statics, we also saw that whatever force is acting there is going to come backwards like this and so it will be reflecting onto this joint, then this joint, this joint and velocities tend to propagate in that direction. So this is my theta uh, which is going in this direction. Okay. So in this uh, robot arm, what we find is that the velocities propagate from the, end of, uh, from the base to the end effector and the forces propagate from the end effector uh, to the base joint. Now what this means is that every joint, so the important point here is every joint uh, or the motion of every joint, so the motion of every joint affects the other joints also, affects all the other joints. So the motion of every joint affects all other joints. So this is uh, something that we need to understand and we need to realize essentially uh, from our dynamic equation. So this basically means that if I have my hand which you can see and I am moving my hand, uh, so what it would mean is that if I have a velocity at this joint, so the velocities are going to move in this direction. So even if this joint is not moving, so if I say in the planar case if this is my joint 1, this is my joint 2 and the end effector is there and I say that my arm is moving on this uh, plane and this joint is moving but this joint is not moving. Okay. So just because this joint is not moving, it does not mean that it will not be subjected to forces. Okay. And where these forces will come from? Because this fellow is moving, so this uh, motion of this uh, joint will get transmitted in this direction and that is going to cause torques here. Okay. Now uh, you might be thinking that so what? Now the point is that because the joint of uh, one, uh, the joint of every, uh, sorry, the motion of every joint is uh, affecting every other joint, what it will mean is that even if a joint is not moving, it is still subjected to uh, forces which are coming in this direction or in this direction. And uh, this is basically uh, the dynamic equation tells us that, so this is a nonlinear coupled, so this is a nonlinear coupled uh, differential equation. Good. So first of all, these terms it is nonlinear, then it is coupled. Essentially it means that every joint affects every other joint and because of which it is coupled. Okay. Now, uh, so what makes robot control very difficult is that this is a nonlinear uh, system and uh, it is a coupled system meaning every joint is affecting every other joint. And uh, uh, so uh, control becomes very, very difficult. So control is actually what we call a multi-input, multi-output system. There is multiple inputs because velocity of every joint is affecting every other joint. So there are multiple inputs which are coming and it is a multi, multiple output system. So in reality it is a multi-input, multi-output system. Okay. And uh, this is something which makes robot control uh, very, very difficult. But to make it simple, what we do is we make the assumption that this is a single input, uh, single output system. Okay. So, and we, so this is an assumption that we are making. Okay. Please uh, note that when we say linear control, in, in reality this system is not a linear control system. Okay. It is a non-linear coupled differential equation and hence it is not a linear control system. But we make an assumption by saying that this is a single input, single output system and we say it is independent joint control. So the word used here is independent independent joint control. So what does uh, 
no, independent joint control mean? Independent joint control essentially means that uh, the joints are being controlled, uh, making an assumption that the other joints are not affecting it. Why? Because there is no way of uh, knowing. The controller has, suppose it is PC controlled here. So, this PC has no way of knowing that uh, what is the effect that is coming on this joint uh, from the other joints uh, by computing dynamics. And dynamics cannot be done in real time. So, uh, the question of computing all the forces and uh, torques because of Coriolis centrifugal inertia which is coming from the other joints, uh, it is not possible in real time and hence the controller cannot find out in real time what all the other joint, uh, what is the effect of the other joints on this joint. So, uh, something to remember here, uh, the first is that this is a couple differential equation which is given here. Second is that in reality it is a multi input multi output system and uh, we are making the assumption that we are making it uh, a single input single output system. We are making the assumption and uh, it is independent joint control. That means every joint would be having a motor, gear and an encoder and there is no effect between the joints. So, this joint does not know what is happening uh, on that joint and that is the assumption we are making. And hence we are converting this problem into a linear uh, control, uh, linear control problem. So, this is a linear uh, linear control uh, problem. Okay. So, this is a simplification we are making uh, because control of the uh, nonlinear system is extremely difficult. Okay. So, now uh, let us look at uh, this. Now, so this linear control problem uh, is an approximate. So, this is essentially an approximate method because the actual problem is nonlinear and we are simplifying it and making it into a, a linear control uh, problem. Okay. Now, uh, let us write the, so at every joint here, we have a joint here. Uh, so, let us assume that every joint can be replaced or can be uh, represented. So, a joint can be represented as having a mass, okay. it has some stiffness and there is some damping. So, I am making the assumption that the joint has mass, you know the joint has mass, it has some uh, because uh, it is a rigid body, so it has some mass. Now, it is not perfectly rigid, so it has some stiffness or it has some k. Okay, so, there is an m, there is a k. Now, k is like uh, a spring, you know in reality there is, uh, there are no perfectly rigid bodies, so the link will have some flexibility. So, if the robot link is very long, what would happen if I put a weight in here, it is going to deflect about the joint. Deflection is there, it is very small, but it is there that I am going to replicate by my stiffness k and that is friction. So, my friction is what we call as uh, B. So, let, let me call this an MBK system. Okay. So, this is mass, this is stiffness, this is uh, friction at the joints. And uh, we can replicate this uh, making it very simple to understand that we have a mass, we have a spring and we have a damper. So, this is my mass spring damper model MB and uh, K model. Okay. So, this is an MBK model and the equation of motion and the equation of motion is given by mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx is equal to 0. So, if you draw, draw the free body diagram of this mass, then what are the forces which are acting? One is the inertia force which is there because of the mass, then there is a spring force and there is a damping force. So, if when we draw the free body diagram and write out the force balance equation, it will come as this. So, this is my equation of uh, motion. Now, the solution of this uh, equation of motion is a time function uh, that specifies the motion of the block depending on the initial conditions. Okay. So, how this is going to move uh, would be determined by the, uh, by the solution of this equation okay, depending on the initial conditions. Now, uh, how the system is going to behave okay, or what is the characteristic motion? the characteristic motion is what I mean is suppose I were to push this a little bit, suppose I am going to push this uh, block a little bit and leave it, suppose I push it a little bit here and I leave it. So, it has come to this green position, it was here, it has come here. Now, how is it going to behave or how is it going to move is the characteristic motion. Now, you can visualize that there is uh, two terms here, one is a k, okay, the other is a b. Now, k is a spring stiffness and uh, b is your uh, damping. So, depending on uh, whether you have a very soft spring. So, the spring can be soft or it can be very hard depending on whether it is a hard spring or a hard soft spring, it will oscillate in that particular fashion. 
Okay? So, if it is a very strong spring, it is not going to oscillate much. If it is a very weak spring, it will start oscillating a lot. So, B is friction. So, if there is a lot of friction, what will happen? The motion is going to be very sluggish. Now, if, the mo if there is very low friction, then it is going to move very smoothly. So, depending on the values of K and B, uh, this is going to behave in a particular way. And the solution of this equation uh, depends on the characteristic equation. So, if I write this as equation number 1, let me write this as equation number 1. Now, the solution of this equation, so solution of equation 1, equation 1 uh, depends on the characteristic equation, uh, depends on the characteristic equation and how do we get the characteristic equation? We take the Laplace transform, so we take the Laplace transform of uh, 1 and we get our equation of the form m s squared, uh, m s squared plus b s plus k is equal to 0. Okay? So, this is our characteristic equation that is equation number 2. So, this is what is called the characteristic equation. So, the solution of this basically uh, would depend on the uh, roots of the characteristic equation. So, roots of this. So, if we talk about the roots of this equation. Uh, so, let me write down the equation again m x double dot uh, sorry m s squared plus uh, b x uh, plus k is equal to 0. Okay. Now, uh, we need to find the roots of this equation. Okay. Now, you know the roots of this equation would have two roots because it is s s to 2 there. So, s 1 and s 2 are two roots and the general form of this you would have studied in uh, high school is minus m by uh, b by 2 m root over b squared minus 4 m k uh, by 2 m again. Okay. So, the roots of this equation are given by uh, this, uh, this terms s 1 and s 2 are two roots. Now, you see here, we see here that essentially there is a b squared minus 4 m k under a square root. So, depending on uh, the values of uh, b, b, m and k, this term here, so this term here b squared minus 4 m k can be uh, greater than 0 or b squared minus 4 m k would be equal to 0 or b squared minus 4 m k could be less than 0. Okay. So, there are three conditions that happen essentially because of the b squared minus 4 m k being under a square root here. Okay. So, depending on this, the system is going to uh, respond. Okay. Now, uh, what do we mean by system respond? That is, if I disturb it a little bit. Okay. So, let me draw, let me draw the, the curve here. Okay. So, this is my time axis and this is my x axis. So, if I take it here and I leave it, so whether it will come down like this and stop here or it will start oscillating like this and it will stop like this or it will just keep going uh, oscillating like this. So, this is what I mean by the three, uh, the response of the system okay, or how it is going to behave. So, essentially this uh, response we can get as a solution of the equation of motion and if b squared is minus 4 m k, then what we do get is we will get real roots. So, real plus unequal roots and in this case we are going to get and this is basically called uh, this is called over damp system. So, in over damp system it is going to behave it is going to be very very sluggish it will come like this and then it will stop it is not going to oscillate much. This is uh, real and equal roots real and equal. Uh, so, real and equal roots would mean uh, real and equal would uh, basically mean uh, that uh, it is critically damped and this one we are going to get uh, complex roots, this is under damped. So, here basically we are getting uh, uh, we, we are seeing that we get three kinds of behavior. The first kind of behavior is this, second is this and a third is that. Okay. Now, uh, out of this if I were to mark it here, so this one is the overdamp system which is number 1 which has moved very slowly and has come to rest. The second one is uh, real and equal roots that is critically damped system where we are getting uh, this kind of behavior which is number 2 and the oscillating one is the one which is imaginary uh, roots are having complex roots. This is my uh, underdamp system. Okay. So, depending on the values of b squared minus 4 m k, 
we are going to get uh, a particular way it is going to behave. Okay. So, uh, in terms of control system which behavior do we want? So, normally we would want the system to behave in a critically damped fashion. So, basically uh, we want a number 2. So, we want basically that b squared minus 4 m k is equal to 0 or from here we can also write b squared is equal to 4 m k. Okay. Uh, and uh, the and it will be called critical damping of roots. So, the system is going to behave like this. So, it will come like this, it will oscillate a little bit and then come to rest like that. Okay. Now, uh, so this is the basic way the system is uh, going to behave. Now, in this equation we saw that this, uh, there is no external force here. Okay. So, there is no actuator, it is just the link or the just the joint. Now, if I add an actuator, so joint plus actuator, I add an actuator also, what the actuator will do is it is going to give some force okay, in this case. In the case of a link, it is going to give some torque. So, now let us see that in our system we have uh, the spring mass damper system plus we have an actuator there. So, our system will look something like this. Okay, so, this is my m, uh, this is b the damping and this is my friction here. Okay. So, now this is my uh, force f and uh, uh, so, uh, this is my uh, force f, this is m, m, this is b and this is k. Okay. Now, the equation of motion if I write it is going to become m x double dot plus b x dot plus k x is equal to the force f. Okay. And uh, uh, what we are trying to do now is that if I uh, want to move this, okay, so the position regulator would, uh, so uh, the first kind of control system we are going to, uh, going to design is called a position regulator. So, this is called a position regulator. So, a position regulator would tend to or try to keep uh, the block m in some position. So, it will try to man, uh, keep the, uh, it will try to, well, let us say it will try to maintain the position of the block. Okay, let us say try to maintain, uh, maintain the position of the block. of the block m. So, this is the simplest and it is called a position regulator. So, what it does is essentially it will try to maintain the position of the block. So, now let us uh, talk about control. If you are trying to control this, what is control here? Control is trying to maintain the position of the block. Okay. And what is the basic definition of a control system? A control system is we need to find out a suitable input to get a suitable, uh, to get a desired output. Uh, to get a desired output. Okay. So, the basic definition of a control system is that a control system tries to find out a suitable input to get a desired output. In our case, what is the suitable input is f, the actuator is giving and what is the suitable desired output is it should maintain the position of this fellow at x. Okay. So, now let us say that uh, uh, suppose I give some f and I disturb the mass, the mass is being disturbed and uh, again let us say the mass has moved from here to here, the mass has moved here. So, x has moved to x dashed. Okay. Now, how much force is required to bring it back would depend uh, on what? So, first of all, uh, we to bring it back I will have to give some force. Now, this force, external force would be proportional to the distance by which it has been displaced. So, distance of displacement. Okay which is x. So, it is proportional to x. right? Now, uh, it is uh, proportional to the distance of uh, by which it has been displaced. What it means is, if this x is large, if this displacement is large, then I will need more f. So, and if this x is small, then I will need less f. So, this is uh, very logical to understand that if x is, uh, is if x is more, then I will need more f and if it is less, it will need less f. So, if I write in terms of, so if it is proportional to, then I write a proportionality constant k p into x. Okay. So, uh, the first one is uh, uh, we find that f is, a, uh, is proportional to the distance of the displacement. Now, uh, this, this is not enough, the force has also to be proportional to the velocity of motion, the velocity okay, which is x dot. 
Okay. Why it is has to be proportional to uh, the velocity of the motion? Because essentially, when this is moving, you can uh, you can understand that if it is proportional only to the distance, the moment distance becomes equal to zero, what would happen is the ve the velocity is still not zero because of inertia. Okay, so the block will just go forward. So if you're trying to stop it at some location, you will not be able to stop it essentially because uh, once it comes to that location, x becomes zero. But then the system has inertia; the mass has inertia, so it will simply go forward or it will go backward. Okay, so the depending on the direction of the force. So in order to uh, ensure that as it is coming closer and closer, the velocity should keep decreasing or the force keeps decreasing. Okay, so for that we use a second term where uh, the force applied is proportional to the velocity of motion and uh, this is equal to k, uh, we can call it kb, uh, no let us call it kd, so kd into x dot. Okay. So this is what we call by the proportional control, this is proportional okay. and this is my derivative control. So it is important to understand why are we using both uh, p and d, why one is not enough because uh, it is very logical that the force should be equal to the displacement. Okay, uh, large displacement means large force. Uh, but if you, but the moment this uh, displacement becomes equal to zero, the system will not stop because of inertia, because of which we have to add one more term, which is the derivative term, uh, which is given by k d into x dot. So this is in uh, general what we call by our P D controller at the simplest uh, level. Now, if I take this and put it in my equation, so f is equal to uh, minus kp into x minus kd into x dot. Okay. Now, uh, now if I take this and put it in equation, let us call this my equation number 1, uh, sorry, this is equation number 3. So, putting this in equation 3, what we do get is uh, uh, m, mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx is equal to minus kp into x minus kd into x dot. Okay. So, we have uh, x and x dot on the left hand side and right hand side. So, I bring these two terms. So, these two terms I bring them to this side. So, these two terms uh, uh, containing x and x dot I bring them on the left hand side and what we get is mx double dot plus uh, x dot into b plus k d plus x into uh, this is k plus uh, kp is equal to 0. Okay. Now, from here what we do is uh, uh, I write this, I simplify this further and, si and write this as b dashed. So, b dashed this full term I am going to write it as b dashed into x dot plus now k dashed into x is equal to 0. Now, why are we doing it like this? Uh, we are do writing it in this form because we know that for a system uh, which has an equation of this nature. Okay, if we can bring it into this nature, uh, uh, we, we can write it uh, uh, this way. Okay, if I can write it this way, then I know that how it is going to behave. It will depend on the, the characteristic, uh, the roots of the equation will depend on the characteristic equation which is this and then depending on these conditions, I know how it is going to behave. Right? That is the reason we bring it there. And here we have also said that essentially I want to make it critically damped. So, if the system is critically damped, uh, I know what is the condition required. So, it is b squared minus 4 m k is equal to 0 or b squared is equal to 4 m k. Now, something to note here is that there are two unknowns here. So, there are two unknowns. Let us call this equation number 4. So, two unknowns in equation number 4. What are the unknowns? Uh, k d is an unknown and k p is an unknown. M b k are known because M b k are uh, system parameters. So, they are known but k d and k p are unknown. So, you have uh, two unknowns in this equation. So, one, uh, one equation uh, with uh, two unknowns. Okay. Uh, so, which means that uh, there is nothing like uh, what is the exact value of k p or k d okay. because you have only one equation and uh, two unknowns. So, it can have multiple solutions now. So, uh, the question of saying what is the best gain, what is the optimal gain actually does not mean uh, much, but it basically means that for a particular application, uh, are you happy with the uh, performance of the system for a particular KP and KD? Okay, that is what it means. So, to solve this basically, we will be needing two conditions. One is that, uh, how do we solve this equation? Uh, how do we find the values of KP and KD? So, first is that we can assume it is critically damped. Okay. So, it is critically damped 
by saying that b squared in this case b dash squared is equal to 4 m k dash. So, the system is critically damped and number 2 is we have to assume uh, the stiffness uh, make an assumption for k dash. Okay. So, I have to put some numerical value uh, make an assumption means put a numerical value uh, make an assumption or assume a value. So, put a numerical value. So, I have two conditions this and that now I can solve this equation because there are two uh, knowns now. Okay. So, let us take an example. So, in this equation let us say that uh, uh, in a system which is given by m x double dot plus b dash x dot plus k dash x is equal to 0, uh, m is equal to b is equal to k is equal to 2 units. Okay, let us make the assumption okay. and uh, now uh, k p and k d are not known, k p and k d are uh, not known. So, here let us make the assumption that uh, uh, k p k v or k d. So, let me make the assumption that k p is 16 now. Okay. Now, I want to find what is k d. Okay. So, first of all we have made this assumption or we that k p is equal to 16. Number 2 is it is critically damped. So, this is 1 critically damped. So, b, b dash squared is equal to 4 m k dash. Okay. So, this is my second assumption. Now, I can go ahead and solve it. Now, when we are given that k p is equal to 16, what we can find from here is that k dash uh, k dash is equal to. So, what is k dash? k dash is equal to k plus k p okay, which is equal to 18. So, we are given that k is equal to 2 and k. So, this is 2 and that is uh, 16. So, it is equal to 18. So, uh, k dash is equal to 18. So, from here we can find uh, b dash b dash is equal to 2 root 2 root m k dash which is equal to 2 root 2 into 18 uh, which is equal to 12. Okay. So, we get what is uh, b dash now b dash is equal to uh, 18. Now, from here we know what is b dash b dash is equal to uh, b dash is equal to b plus k d right. So, it implies that k d is equal to uh, b dash minus b which is equal to 12 uh, minus 2 which is equal to 10. Okay. So, what we find is that uh, k d in this case is equal to 10. Uh, and k p our gain is equal to 16. Okay. The other parameters are not all known. So, now how do we proceed? So, k p what we did find is uh, k p is equal to 16 and k d is equal to 10. Okay. So, what we do is we put it in the equation uh, in, in our equation and then we find the uh, response of the system uh, response of system. Okay. So, suppose now my system is behaving like this. Okay, okay. Suppose uh, my time response is like this. This is t. That is my x uh, for a given value of k p and k d. It is behaving like this, and I'm happy with the system. So if I, if you are happy with the performance of the system, then we can uh, say that this is acceptable. Now, if you are not happy, for example, you wanted to respond faster. You wanted to do like this. Okay. Then what we can do is we can increase k p. Okay. Uh, so try another value of k p. For example, k p is equal to uh, 20 then find k d again and then again draw it and see if you are happy. So, when we uh, when we uh, do this method iteratively this is basically what you call by tuning uh, tuning of uh, motor or tuning of a controller. So, essentially we use different values of k p find what is k d look at the response of the system if you are happy is great if you are not happy then you change the values and do that again. So, this is basically what is called tuning and nowadays we have software which can do auto tuning of uh, of control systems. Okay. Now, uh, uh, something that we noticed here is that uh, uh, this in our the way we wrote our equation m x double dot plus p dash x uh, plus x is equal k x is equal to f okay, that there are some parameters here which can vary. For example, we saw that uh, this b uh, this this friction and damping and there is inertia. So, there are three parameters here. So, there is uh, mass, there is damping and there is uh, friction. Okay. So, three parameters are there on the system. Uh, now, suppose uh, to make our control system easier, if I can reduce this. So, what I am trying to do next is reduce to a unit mass uh, to a unit mass system. 
uh, such that I will need to control only uh, a system which is having a unit mass and I am going to reduce this control system into two parts. One part is called the servo part and the other part is called the model part. Okay. So, the model part are the ones that will contain the MBK parameters. So, if there is any change on any of this, uh, it does not matter, it does not affect the servo part and servo part is the one that has the KP and the KDs. Okay. So, I am basically going to partition my control system and this is what is basically called control system partitioning. So, this one was a position regulator, now we are partitioning it and we are saying this is a partitioned Uh, partition uh, control system. So, what is a partition control system? We are partitioning the total control system into a model part and a servo part. Okay. And uh, how do we do that is I am making this assumption that m x double dot plus p x dot plus k x this is a very general. So, uh, b dashed I am replacing it by b it is a general term I am going to replace f by two terms now m into f dashed. Uh, sorry, let us call it alpha, alpha plus uh, beta, where alpha is equal to m and beta is equal to uh, k x plus p x dot. Okay. So, if I put it back into this equation, so if I take these two terms and put it back into that equation, then what I am going to get is m x double dot uh, plus b x dot plus k x is equal to uh, alpha into m uh, plus b x dot plus k x. Okay. So, this is what I am going to get and from here we can uh, we can see that this 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 will cancel with this. So, this cancels and this m sorry this is alpha is equal to m sorry. So, this is uh, m into so this term here is m into f dashed right alpha is equal to m. So, this alpha is equal to m and that is where it comes from. Okay. So, now we see that this term cancels and uh, the other term this m and this m cancels. So, what we are left with is x double dot is equal to f dashed. So, this is we have reduced it uh, reduced to a uh, unit mass system. So, this means that we are trying to control uh, only a unit mass. Now, this f we have to give a suitable f so that we are able to move the unit mass in any way that we want it to move. Okay. And our control system can uh, uh, now be written as f dashed is equal to uh, minus k d into x dot minus k p into x. So, I put it here it becomes x double dot plus k d into x dot uh, plus k p is equal to it. So, you can see that this has been reduced to a unit mass. Okay. So, this uh, has been reduced uh, to a unit mass system. So, this is basically called uh, partitioning of control systems. So, let us uh, call it partitioning. Partitioning of control systems or partition control system which means the same thing and we basically partition it by replacing this f with an f dashed and uh, uh, the advantage being that it is reduced to a single uh, single mass system now. Okay. Now, uh, the next thing that we need to look at is this is still a position regulator. So, this is something to note this is still a position regulator and what a position regulator can do it can only maintain. So, it can maintain the position of a, of a unit uh, PO. So, it can maintain the position of the block. Okay. It cannot track a trajectory. So, it cannot track. So, it cannot track uh, trajectory. Okay. So, the next thing we will need to look at is we need to look at uh, trajectory tracking. Okay. Uh, so, the next step of our control system design would take us to trajectory following controllers. Trajectory following and how we do trajectory following is essentially we define an error. Okay. So, uh, uh, very simply speaking is here and I want to go here. Okay. So, this is my theta, uh, theta 1, this is my theta 2. Now, let us call it theta, theta 1 and theta 1 dashed, no, theta, theta and theta dashed okay, in some time delta. So, what we will do is we will generate a function an error function e which is going to be theta dashed minus theta okay. and then try and make this go towards 0. 
So what it basically means is that when this is moving, this error between this, uh, this and this is going to decrease. And the moment it becomes 0, we know we have reached. Okay? That is essentially what a trajectory following uh, controller does. And we define an error as we are talking in x in terms of x. So x minus uh, x d minus x, x d is desired and x is present where in this case x d is my desired position. And we are going to write our equation and uh, this error is called servo error. And we are going to write our f dashed to be equal to x x d double dot plus k d into e dot plus k p into e. Okay. So, if you go back a little bit here and see what we had got is uh, we had got a, we are trying to control a unit mass system again. Okay. So, basically what is my f dashed uh, now? My f dashed is equal to in terms of error I am writing it like this. So, what is on the other side on the left hand side on the left hand side I have x double dot. So, x double dot is equal to x double dot d. This is my unit mass which I have got from, uh, from here. So, this is my unit mass how I reduce it to a unit mass and now this is being controlled by k d into e dot plus k p into e. Now, if you look at here I can bring this one this side. Okay. Well, let me write it here x d double dot minus x double dot plus uh, k d into e dot plus k p into e is equal to 0. Okay. Now, what is this equal to? This is equal to e double dot. So, my equation in terms of error becomes e double dot plus k d into e dot uh, plus k p into e is equal to 0. Okay. Now, this is basically what we call by a partition control system and this is in the uh, error domain. Okay. So, what we are trying to do is we are generating an error and the control system will tend to take this error and uh, make it equal to 0. Once it is able to do that, then basically it means that my uh, the link has reached the respective position. Now, something to note, let us uh, have a very uh, quick, let us just draw the flowchart of this uh, control system, what it will look like. So, it will look something like this. The partition control system has two parts. This is my system actually. Then we have Bx dot plus Kx is here and k d and k p are here. So, one, one of the loops are going into k p, the other loop which is coming here. So, the other loop which is coming is going here. Okay. And uh, this is also going here. Okay. And from here we are coming to um, this is going forward here. Okay. So, now this is my k d. So, this is my x dot and this is my x. Okay. Now, if you look at this control system, what is the desired? The desired is x double dot the velocity is desired. Next, what is also desired is the, uh, the x d and what is also desired is the x x dot d. So, in this equation uh, what is it that we need? We need the, uh, the errors that means we need the uh, error in the velocities, we need the error in the position, this is the error in the accelerations. So, all these uh, three terms are required and based on these three terms we can uh, get this control system. So, the entered uh, so the desired uh, velocity is to be entered here, desired position here and the desired uh, and the desired position is here. So, now this has two parts, this part is called the servo part and this part is called the model part. Uh, sorry, the, the other way around, this is called the uh, uh, model part and this is called the servo part. Okay. So, now you can see that the uh, it has been uh, decoupled or it has been partitioned. So, this has been par, so this control system has been partitioned into two parts which is the, so one part is the model part and the other part is the servo part, so into two parts. The servo controller works in its, uh, in its own by looking at the k p and the k d gains and the model part takes into account the system model in terms of m, b and k. Okay. So, this has been partitioned uh, in this way and this is one way of controlling uh, robot manipulators 
using partition uh, control system. Now, uh, what we need to see further is uh, two important points. Uh, the first is that uh, when we are looking at uh, the control system, the equation of the control system comes out like this, uh, which we derived here. Now, this is coming out to be of the form E double dot plus k d into E dot plus k p into E is equal to 0, uh, sorry is equal to f dashed. There is some f dashed as a disturbance here. Okay. Now, what is this disturbance? This disturbance can be coming from the dynamics okay because we have seen that the velocity the accelerations uh, cause inertia forces curly centrifugal force and these forces move from uh, the end effector to all the joints so in effect what is uh, dynamics doing is dynamics is uh, disturbing the whole system so when the control system is trying to control the arm to move the arm to a desired location uh, or position what the dynamics is doing is it is disturbing that so this is written in terms of f dashed uh, as a disturbance here okay so our equation was uh, here. Now, uh, this is my disturbance which is coming in terms of the dynamics or any other disturbance in terms of noise, okay. uh, then unmodeled dynamics, unmodeled sensor, noise, okay, whatever is coming as a disturbance. Okay. Now, in steady state, in steady state we know the system is, uh, is at rest and E double dot is equal to E dot is equal to 0 okay, in steady state. Now, uh, this disturbance is never equal to 0 because whatever you do, this disturbance will never be equal to 0. Okay. So, this disturbance is always there. The other, uh, so this is one in steady state. The second is uh, this f disturbance, we say it is bounded. That means it cannot be infinity. So, it is bounded within some bounds and we say it is less than alpha. Okay. So, this is a bounded input, bounded output system. Uh, which basically means that the disturbance that is come uh, is coming on the system is bounded. So now, if you look at uh, uh, equation uh, this equation again, let's call it equation number five. If you look at equation number five again, and in that, if you put e double dot uh, plus k d into e dot plus k p into e is equal to f disturbance, and if this is equal to zero and that is equal to zero, because in steady state velocities are zero, then k p into e is equal to f dash into disturbance, okay, which means that E is equal to f dash disturbance divided by k p. Okay. Now, this basically means that uh, at steady state condition, your error is not equal to 0. This is showing that error is not equal to 0, okay. that there is a, some error which is going to remain and that is your f disturbance by uh, k p, whatever is the value of your k p. And this is uh, uh, so. This is a property of PD controllers. Something to remember: in PD controller, error steady state is not equal to zero. What it physically means is, if I draw it here. Uh, so let me. Uh, so in a PD controller, we see that uh, in a PD controller, uh, this is going to happen. So the error is not going to become equal to zero. So, error steady state will not become equal to 0, it will have some finite value. Now, what does it basically mean is that if I have a system which is like this okay, and I am using a PD controller, so what it will do is it will do like this and uh, depending on the values of, uh, depending on the values of, uh, so it can go and it is going to stay, it is going to, let me enlarge it and remain like that. Okay. So, this is as time is going to infinity, uh, this is my x, there is going to be some error there and this error is my ESS. Okay. So, in a PD controller, we are never going to be able to reach that exact position, but we can go very near that position. Now, the second uh, important point here is that why do PD controllers, uh, so we have seen here that PD controllers have some error steady state and lot of industrial controllers are actually PD controllers. But then that brings us to the question that uh, why uh, does PD controllers work or why, uh, why do PD controllers uh, work in controlling a robot arm? This is an important question, an interesting question because in robotics there is two fundamental problems. So, in robotics, especially in robotics, we have two, first of all PD controller has error steady state not equal to 0. 
okay. And in a robot uh, in a robotics application the mass that the robot is going to pick up or well, let us call it the uh, the weight uh, th that the robot can pick uh, uh, is uh, so the weight that the robot can pick causes changes causes changes in in end effector mass. So, what I mean here is that there is a robot here okay, and it has links and there is uh, it is picking up some object which has some mass m g. Now, this m g the moment the object is there the m g will have some value the moment it, catch, it catches and moves it will have some value m g the moment it leaves okay, this m g will become equal to 0 that, because there is no mass now. Okay. So, essentially in robotics what happens is the moment a robot picks up something uh, suddenly the weight goes up at the end effector and the moment it leaves m g becomes 0 and the weight comes down. So, there is a change in the in the uh, in the weight of the end effector now. Now, you might say so what now this essentially change in m uh, at end effector uh, will cause problems in the uh, in the tuning of the uh, tuning of gains. Okay, so, k p and k d gains uh, are tuned for a fixed uh, for a fixed gain uh, for a fixed mass. Okay. So, m b k parameters when we are tuning we saw our p d controller that these parameters cannot vary, but now we are seeing that the mass is varying because of the weight of the weight of uh, object okay. and hence you see that p d controllers actually have a problem here, but it is interesting to note that you know, in spite of this problem PD controllers actually work uh, for a robotics application because of this uh, very interesting reason that let us look at the actual flow diagram. So, this is my uh, flow diagram of uh, a motor which is uh, so this is a motor let us say this is my motor the motor output is connected to a gear. Okay, so, this is a gear and the gear is connected to a link. So, this is my link which is moving this side. So, if you can imagine this is a robot end effector there and this is my link. Okay. So, the link is uh, connected till here. Okay. So, this is my motor uh, this is the motor axis sorry this is the link axis this is the motor axis. Now, we know that the motor has a motor inertia J m this is my motor angle and this is my motor damping which is there. Let us say that k at the moment is equal to 0 because stiffness is very very small. Okay. Now, uh, there is a gear here okay, and uh, the output of the gear is going to become so this is my motor theta l and this is my uh, j l j l and theta l. Okay. Now, the motor is producing a torque tau m this torque is rotating the motor uh, rotor then is getting multiplied by the uh, the gear ratio which is zeta and then is going to the other side. So, my total uh, equation if I sum it up what will happen this torque is rotating the motor uh, rotor and is rotating the gear and is also rotating the link on this side. So, this is my link. Okay. So, if I write this equation then tau m is equal to uh, j m is equal to j m into theta m double dot plus uh, b m into theta m dot uh, plus 1 by gear ratio this gear ratio is uh, coming in between here. So, this whatever torque is going on this side. So, what the gear ratio is doing it is increasing the torque and is decreasing the speed into uh, j l into theta l double dot plus uh, b l into theta l dot this is my total equation. Okay. So, the motor torque that is being produced is consumed in rotating the rotor overcoming the, uh, the friction at the, uh, the rotor then it is going forward it is getting uh, the speed is reducing and the, uh, the torque is increasing and that is getting consumed in moving the link and uh, overcoming the, the friction at the link level okay, at the link uh, uh, positions. So, now if you look at uh, this uh, equation now we also have the let us write it here. So, theta l the uh, is equal to 1 by theta theta m right. 
So, the speeds of the link is much much less than the speed of the motor. The motor will rotate at very high speed like 3000 rpm. We have to decrease the speed and we have to increase the uh, torques. So, from here I can also write theta dot is equal to 1 by zeta theta m dot and theta l double dot is equal to 1 by zeta theta m double dot. Okay? So, we have three expressions which is showing the relationship between the motor velocity, link velocity, motor acceleration, link acceleration. Okay. Now, if I am going to uh, this equation has two variables, one is theta m, the other one is theta l. So, what we are doing here is I will replace the theta m and the theta l's, uh, sorry, I will replace the theta l's. So, all the theta l's uh, will be replaced, replaced by theta m. Okay. So, correspondingly theta double dot and theta dot l l will be replaced by theta m double dot, uh, theta m dot and theta l dot, uh, sorry theta m dot here. So, if I do that, then what will happen is I can write my tau m equation as uh, j m theta m double dot plus b m uh, theta m dot plus 1 by zeta into my theta l double dot will from here. So, this theta l double dot will become j l into theta m double dot by zeta plus b l into theta m dot by zeta. Right? So, simply by using this equation and this equation. Right? Now, uh, what I will do is I will bring all the theta m's together. So, tau m is equal to theta m double dot divided by j m plus j l by zeta squared. So, if this zeta and this zeta will become zeta squared uh, and I have b m uh, sorry I have theta m here and uh, this is equal to j sorry b l. So, this is equal to b m plus b l by zeta squared. Okay. Now, this is a very important equation and it is a very, very important and very, very um, critical equation in the sense that this is showing us that essentially what is happening here is that uh, we said that the when the robot picks up an object, okay, the mass of the end effector is going to change, okay, the weight because of the object being there now. So, the tuning of PD controllers should not uh, actually work because PD controllers have been tuned with a particular M and if you change the M, then the controller is uh, going out of sync. But what it does, uh, what, uh, what does happen is that you see that the gear ratio is coming in the denominator here. So, if my J L which is the link inertia, so J L, uh, J L uh, changes, then the change of J L is divided by the square of uh, zeta squared. So, what would effectively happen is the, the effect of the change of the mass of the link will have very, very little effect on your uh, motor side, on the motor side. So, here if we have a mass uh, mg which is at the end effector and suddenly the link goes up, uh, suddenly the mass of the link goes up, but what would happen is this change in mass is divided by the square of the gear ratio. So, which will basically mean the net effect here is negligible. So, the net effect on this is uh, very small. Okay. So, to give an example, so we have uh, tau m is equal to tau m is equal to uh, what we just saw here is equal to j m uh, plus j m by zeta squared into theta m and double dot plus we have uh, b l b m plus b l by zeta squared. So, suppose we say that the weight of an object it can pick up is 50 kg okay, and my gear ratio is equal to 100. Okay. So, what it basically means is that the effect of this fellow, okay, if we suddenly pick up a J L, so the effect of this becomes J L uh, plus 50, but this is divided by 100 uh, square. Okay, so, it is J L plus 50 uh, uh, divided by uh, 4 zeros. Okay. So, if J L is very small, uh, if the link mass is small, just, uh, just for uh, explaining if this is very small, uh, if this is small, then what we can say it is divided by 50 by uh, by this and which is equal to 0 0.005 which is as good as uh, is almost 0. Okay. So, this shows that any change in any change in uh, end mass uh, does not affect does not affect uh, the uh, PD controller 
And this is the, the main reason why PD controllers are still used in robotics and PD controllers can uh, uh, give satisfactory performance. The most important result of this, the model of the story is that motors uh, plus gears should be used. If you do not use gears, what will happen is if your gear ratio becomes 1 or your gear ratio becomes 0, then your PD controller will go out of sync. So this basically means that in our independent joint control, when we started off today, we said the motor must be having a gear sitting in front. And if you look at any motors, you'll find that there is a gear in front. So with this, we end our, uh, our discussion on linear control systems. Uh, thank you.